Amen. I'd like to begin this morning by introducing you to my family tree. You want to you meet my family tree? All right, so there they are. That photo was taken in 1954, and that young whippersnapper right in the very front, the short guy, the little guy, that's my old man, Paul Roundtree, the last of seven kids. There he is with all of his siblings. Behind him, that's my grandmother. We, call her mom, or we called her Mommy. Uh, she's the mother of those seven kids. She lived till 96 years old, just long enough to hold my firstborn child, who was named after her. Behind Mommy uh, is that man right there. You see him in the very back, the big tall guy. That was her husband, the grandfather that I never met. I hear he was called Big John. He was a big man, quite clearly, physically, but he was kind of big in every circle. He was the big man of the house of seven kids, and in the community, he was the big man of the school. He was whatever community they were a part of. He was the school principal. I come from a family of school teachers and educators. That was Big John. Well, Big John never had a single drink of alcohol until he was 42 years old. And by the time he was 58 years old, alcohol had taken everything from him down to his very last breath. It killed him. He left behind Mommy, who stayed a widow for the next 40-plus years after she lost her husband, left behind the seven kiddos, and he, uh, and he left behind grandkids that he would never one day meet. Why do I tell you this? I tell you this because of everything that we've been talking about in this series on freedom, your freedom is never about just you. My freedom is never about just me. Whatever kind of freedom we're talking about, whether it's a freedom from alcohol abuse or prescription drugs or some other kind of addiction, whether it's freedom from depression or freedom from anxiety or freedom of the mind or any kind of freedom that we're talking about, whatever kind of freedom it is, it affects people 100 years from today, the choices that you're making. The freedom that we walk in or don't walk in always has a multi-generational impact. And so today I want to talk about leaving a legacy of freedom. Leaving a legacy of freedom. And I've mentioned a little bit about this series called The Four Pillars of Freedom. This is pillar number four. The first pillar was God's power. And then the second pillar, God's family. The third pillar was last week, God's weapons, the weapons he gives us to win the spiritual battle. This week is God's heart, because we have to understand the heart of our heavenly Father to use your life to impact generations to come. We have to understand the Father's heart if we want to attain and sustain the freedom that he has even for us and especially also for the generations after us. And so this is pillar number four, closing out the series. And uh, and the scripture that we're going to be in this morning is in the book of Galatians, chapter 6. The book of Galatians, chapter 6. I'm turning there in my Bible, but we do have the words up on the screen. And to give you a little bit of context for this book of Galatians, we're going to, we're going to read uh, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6 to give you a little bit of a, a context. The book of Galatians was, well, first of all, originally a letter from the Apostle Paul to a church located in Galatia, which was the, basically the modern area of Turkey. And so it was originally a letter, became part of the Bible, and it was Paul's sort of most frustrated letter, most frustrated epistle. He says things like, 
You guys have abandoned the true gospel of Christ. You've been severed by grace. You've replaced the good news of Jesus with the bad news of Moses. You've replaced the gospel with law and freedom with slavery. And it's where he has this famous line where he says, it's for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, don't submit yourself again to a yoke of slavery. Live out the freedom that Jesus purchased for you, and don't replace the good news of Jesus, the gospel, with the law, the law of Moses. So he spends the whole book leading up until these verses making that argument. Now let's pick it up in verse 1. This is what Paul says. He says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this statement and particularly that last phrase, the law of Christ. Because everything that Paul's been saying in this letter has been building, building up toward this phrase, I want you to understand what the law of Christ is. And it's something that's very different from what he's been saying. It's actually kind of a strange thing for him to say if you think about it. He's been spending five chapters saying, you're free from the law, you're free from the law, you're free from the law. And then he gets to chapter six and he says, you're under the law. And they're like, what? But he's talking about two different laws. You're free from the law of Moses. You're free for the law of Christ. And the difference between the law of Moses and the law of Christ is like the difference between East and West. They couldn't be more different. So I want to give you three differences between the law of Moses and the law of Christ, by the end of which you'll have a better view and understanding of the freedom that God wants to have Uh, are you to have in your life. Three differences, and those differences relate to a different standard, a different power, and a different effect. A different standard, a different power, and a different effect. So let's start with the first one, a different standard. There's a different standard between the law of Moses and the law of Christ. Just one chapter earlier, Galatians 5.14, the Apostle Paul quotes the law of Moses. He quotes the section of the Old Testament where it tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. And and Paul says in that context, when you've done that, you've fulfilled the whole law of Moses, loving your neighbor as yourself. Well, this is probably the most similar part of the two laws, the law of Moses and the law of Christ, because they both direct us toward love, but in a different way. Moses says, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus takes it to a whole new level. He raises the bar and he says, don't just love your neighbor as yourself. Love as you have been loved. Love as you've been loved. And this is what Jesus calls in John 13. He's just finished washing the disciples' feet. Just mind-blowing, right? The Lord of the universe is like scrubbing boils and hammer toes. <laughs> and so he's washed their feet, and then he tells the disciples the statement that used to like, I was like, what does this mean? Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, love as you've been loved. I remember I used to read that, I was like, it's not new. It's like loving people was like around for a long time, but it was that last part that made it new. That last part that says, as you've been loved, because no one has ever loved like Jesus loved. I mean, if you look through history, you can find a few people, I mean, a generation ago, the king of England, who abandoned his throne for love. But no one has abandoned a throne so high. Jesus was ruling from heaven and abandoned that throne. And he left his life in heaven to come down and live on earth. And if that wasn't enough, no one's ever gone from so high to so low. 
Because not only did he leave his life in heaven for life on earth, he traded his life on earth for death on a cross. I mean, this is like the most like, excruciating death that you could ever imagine. He did that for love. And if that was all he did, if I could even say such a thing, that would be a mind-blowing love. But it goes further. Because Jesus didn't die for a bunch of good people who were just like really close to the, measure, to the standard. He didn't die for people who loved him in return. He died for the very people who were crucifying him. He died for his enemies. Would you die for your most bitter enemy who wanted you dead? I mean, would you, would you trade your life? I mean, this is what he did. He died for his enemies. And if that wasn't enough, the pain of crucifixion was like a mosquito bite in comparison with the greater pain that he felt. The pain of taking upon his shoulders the wrath of God, the judgment of God for your sins and mine to bear billions of people's eternities in hell. I mean, I don't, the math of it I don't even get. But to experience that pain on the cross, that's what he experienced. So he went from that high to that low, no one's ever done that. And then Jesus says, oh, that is how you're supposed to love. You see, it's one thing to love your neighbor as yourself, but Jesus turns our gaze from, away from in here at ourselves. I mean, I do love me, but Jesus loves me more. Jesus loves me, loves you more than you love yourself. He loves us. Everyone with a cross-dying, judgment-bearing sort of love. That's a high standard. And so you have the law of Moses over here, love your neighbor as yourself. And then you have Jesus saying, love as you've been loved. It's a new commandment, a new law, the law of Christ. Now, at first glance, at first glance, this would be kind of demotivating. Like, okay, I really wasn't even doing good with the law of Moses part, and now you're going to come in with this and say, I've got to love like that. I mean, we fall seriously short of that. It seems that it would be crushing, and it would be if we didn't have these other two differences between the law of Christ and the law of Moses. I've said that there was a different standard. Now let's look at the second one, a different power, a different power. For years, it was prophesied, starting with Jeremiah, that there was going to be this new covenant that came. And Jeremiah says that when this new covenant comes, it's a, this is God speaking through the mouth of Jeremiah. It says, I will write their law, my law upon their minds and upon their hearts. And the Apostle Paul jumps on that, piggybacks on that idea. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, the law of Moses was written on tablets of stone. Picture Moses coming down the mountain with those Ten Commandments. He says, the law of Moses was written on tablets of stone, but this new covenant, this new law, the law of Christ, was written not on external tablets of stone, but on what? Tablets of human hearts by the Spirit of God. And what this touches on is a completely different power for living out this higher standard. Because external laws influence us by the power of fear, which is different from how an internal law motivates us. So uh, let me make a little analogy here, okay? Now, I'm sure none of you would ever commit the egregious sin of being late for church. I mean, you probably would never do that. But if there, there was such a, an individual uh, in this congregation, I'm being sarcastic, by the way, if you were late for church, it's okay. I would imagine, though, that if that was you, you probably kind of wanted to go faster than 30 on Smithfield or Starnes or Rumfield or any of these roads. I mean, I, like my natural cruising speed would probably be 50. And so the only thing that, like, maybe you went ahead and went 50 and took the risk, but if you didn't take the risk, the only thing keeping you from going 50 and maybe going like 37, you know, the cop will probably have mercy on that, right? And, so, and going slower was what? the fear of punishment. You don't want a ticket, right? That's how external laws work. That's how the law of Moses worked. It operated by the 
fear of punishment. But the law that's written on the heart is different. It doesn't operate by a fear power presiding over us. Another analogy. I want you to imagine with me that a husband is going away on a business trip, and he's going to be gone for a while. And let's imagine that his wife is maybe starting to feel a little secure, insecure. Maybe the husband's got some attractive female colleagues, and they're going to be traveling with him too. And, and she says to her husband, honey, I, I love you, but I'm, I'm also, I'm, a, I'm afraid that when you're gone, you, you know, you'll slip up, you won't be, I'm just, I'm sorry, I just have this fear. And then I want you to imagine that the husband, fully devoted and dedicated to his wife, says something like, honey, that is the last thing from my mind, that is the last thing I want to do, because I have you written on my heart. Now, if a husband said that, well, what does he mean by that? What he means by that is, my heart isn't for that. There's nothing in me that wants that. I only want you. My heart belongs to you. I'm fully devoted to you. And so his motivation is not a fear of punishment. His motivation is love because his heart has been captured by love. When God writes his law upon your heart, it operates like that. The scripture says perfect love drives out fear because fear relates to punishment. Our primary motivation is this. It's that we have been so profoundly loved, it has captured our hearts and transformed our hearts and our desires so that what we want, what we really want is to obey God. Not out of fear that he's going to cast a lightning bolt upon us, but because a loving God has captured our hearts with love. That becomes our primary influence. And so the difference between the external law of Moses and the internal law of Christ is that one is based on fear, the other is based on love. Our hearts have been transformed and made new with love therefore empowered to live for God in a whole new way. Now for the last one. We've looked at a different standard, a different power, and the last one is a different effect. A different effect. And the different effect goes like this. The law of Moses, you know what the effect of the law of Moses is? Condemnation. The effect of the law of Christ is liberation condemnation and liberation. In fact, Paul says a little earlier in this letter, Galatians chapter 3, that the law of Moses was never even intended for liberation. It was intended for condemnation. God gave the law of Moses to condemn people. And you're like, I kind of don't like that. I kind of don't like God giving a law to condemn people. I thought he didn't really want to condemn people. Well, if somebody visits a doctor and they have cancer, what's the most loving thing the doctor can do? Should he say, oh, they're not going to like this news. I just won't tell them. Or is the most loving thing that he can do to give them a diagnosis so that the sick person might perhaps receive a cure? The purpose of the law of Moses is to diagnose you and diagnose me as sinners who are condemned to spiritual and eternal death. Why? So that we would reach out for a life preserver, a cure whose name is Jesus. The law of Moses condemned, but the law of Jesus liberates. And it liberates by pointing us not to our sin as the law of Moses did, but by pointing us to our Savior, our cure, our life preserver. Romans 8, 2. The Apostle Paul says it like this. He says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. He's just giving them different names. He's saying the law of uh, the law of Christ has set you free from the law of Moses. One condemns, one liberates. Got it? 
And so we have these two laws to summarize. One call, the, the law of Christ calls us to a higher standard, but it gives us a greater power for, deli- uh, for achieving that standard, and it delivers a better effect. Okay, now I've spent a lot of time on this law of Christ. Why? Because I want you to understand the freedom that Paul is talking about. Because he spent the whole letter building up to this point, saying you're free from the law, free from the law, free from the law, free from the law. But you know, humans, we have this tendency to, to swing the pendulum, don't we? It's like if, if I'm over here and someone says, don't go there, well, we go completely to the other side. And Paul's saying to this legalistic, holier-than-thou, religious rule-making, hoop jump, religious hoop-jumping church, he's saying to them, guys, that's not really freedom. Freedom isn't over there. And, you know, some Christians need to hear that because we think it is. We're like, you know, it's, it's not enough to tell a woman to dress modestly. We have to tell them exactly like, you know, no, no further than fingertips. And, you know, we got to make these extra rules. And we define it down to the nth degree, not just for that, but for a million different areas because a lot of people think that freedom comes from that. We just have to dot every I and cross every T. And Paul's saying to the Galatians, no, no, that's not freedom. That's a form of religious slavery. But there's a ditch on both sides of the road. On one side, it's slavery to religion and to rule keeping and to legalism. But on the other side, it's lawlessness. And and it's saying that, hey, it's free for me to just do whatever I want whenever I want. And Paul's saying, well, don't let the pendulum go over there either. Because these are, you know, this is just another form of slavery. The addicted person who's got free to pop another pill, is that freedom or is that slavery? And so Paul's saying, it's neither side. I want you to be free from the religious hoop jumping. I want you to be free from the addiction and the things that are holding you down. There's a danger on both sides of the road, and I have a highway for you. It's called freedom in Christ. And what does it look like? It looks like fulfilling that standard, living out that standard. It looks like loving as Jesus loved. Here's how I wrote it down. I want you to remember this. True freedom is neither legalism nor lawlessness. It's loving as Jesus loved. True freedom is neither legalism nor lawlessness. It's loving as Jesus loved. And it doesn't sound like freedom at first glance because he says, bear one another's burdens. If you've ever been attached to an addict in any way, whether through marriage or serving in a church or whatever it is, you know that it is quite a heavy burden to bear. And yet his point in this passage is that this is what true freedom looks like. Because just as Jesus bore our sins on the cross... We bear the sins of our brothers and sisters who fall into sin. That's that's specifically the burden he's talking about in verse 1. He's talking about the freedom of restoring the person who's fallen into sin. And he says, but this is true freedom. Little example. So, Bill Wilson. Does anybody here know who Bill Wilson is? Three people. (laughs) Bill Wilson was the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. So a little over 80 years ago, Bill Wilson found God, and he found sobriety, and he he co-founded Alcoholics Anonymous. Today there are 100,000 chapters across the world, and 2 million people, and countless thousands of people have discovered God and found sobriety through this 12 steps that he developed out of his own experience of finding God and sobriety. And if you've never really been part of uh, one of the anonymous groups or never really read up on it, the way the steps operate is that the 12th step is way different than the other 11 steps. The other 11 steps, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, recognize that you're powerless and that there's a higher power and you have to surrender to the higher power and make amends. The other 11 steps are really all about getting out of the mud. The 12th step is, is basically like, now that you're out of the mud and you've been in the mud before and you know how horrible it is in the mud, you are in prime position to help other people out of the mud. <laughs> 
Is the reason Alcoholics Anonymous has been so success- successful, at least one big reason, is because of the existence of a 12th step that continues people getting other people free, continues that process. Well, the 12th step was born out of Bill Wilson's own experience. Wilson, soon after, it's a while, you got to read his conversion story and him finding God because he was totally anti-God, found Jesus, had this radical encounter with God, got sober, and he started this like good streak and things were going well. But again, if you've ever worked with an addict, you know how it is and how it's like when they come across a hard time, it's very, very tempting to fall off the wagon again. And so that happened to Bill Wilson. He was on a business trip, everything was cruising, everything was going well. It had been a long planned business trip he was really looking forward to, had high expectations for what was going to happen, and the opposite of all of his expectations happened. It was a disastrous business trip. It was absolutely horrible. And so he's sitting alone in Akron, Ohio, depressed over this total business failure. And what do you think he's thinking about? He's thinking about another drink. And and he's obsessing over another drink. And in the midst of this obsession, a thought pops into his mind. And the thought is, the only way I can stay sober is if I help somebody else stay sober. And he does this wild thing. He gets a phone book. I mean, what even is that? And he gets a phone book, and he starts flipping through church phone numbers, and he starts calling them one by one, saying, you got any drunk people who need some help? One of the churches says, yeah, take your pick. (laughs) And thus, Bill Wilson met a man who would later be known in the Alcoholics Anonymous world as Dr. Bob. He became the other co-founder. He was a drunk person and a surgeon. It was a very dangerous combination. (laughs) It really was. There's a story there. It's kind of wild. But they met up, first time they've ever met, as a result of a phone book, and for six hours, they processed their pain with alcohol together. Bill Wilson was able to help Dr. Bob that day stay sober, and Bill Wilson helping Dr. Bob helped Bill Wilson stay sober. Later, he calls it the great immunity about falling back into other addiction. If you want to stay free, set others free. That's the principle. And that's where this 12th step was born out of. But not only that, he talks about how beautiful it is and how amazing it is. How significant and profound of an experience it is to be part of the process, not just of getting out of the mud, that's profound enough, but helping others out of the mud. This is what he writes in in one of his books, The Twelve Steps and Twelve Traditions. I want to read you a quote. It's about the twelfth step. He says, practically every AA member declares that no satisfaction has been deeper and no joy greater than in a 12th step job well done. To watch the eyes of men and women open with wonder as they move from darkness into light, to see their lives quickly fill with new purpose and meaning, to see whole families reassembled, there's the generations, To see the alcoholic outcast received back into the community in full citizenship, and above all, to watch these people awaken to the presence of a loving God in their lives, these things are the substance of what we receive as we carry AA's message to the next alcoholic. This is the 12-step work in the very best sense of the word, and then he quotes the words of Jesus. He says, freely you have received, freely give. He says it's those words that form the core of what the 12th step is all about. When Jesus writes his law upon your heart, it is a burden. It is painful. It is hard to walk through the process of restoring people that are fallen. It would be so much easier to just go on with our lives and to do our thing. But entering into that process 
bearing others' burdens just as Jesus bore our burden, watching the eyes open, watching the lives be changed, watching people get restored to community and health and sanity and wholeness. And this goes well beyond the freedom of addiction to any other kind of freedom. Watching those light bulbs go off There is nothing in the world like it. And when Jesus transforms your heart, not by the power of fear, but by the power of love, it becomes a joyful burden to bear, just like our Lord, where it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It's a joyous burden when your heart is transformed by the love of Jesus so that you can love like he loved. There is no freedom like it. Freedom isn't in sin. Freedom isn't in setting more rules for ourselves. There's a highway called friendship with Jesus. And it does operate by laws, not the law of Moses that condemns, the law of Christ that sets us free. Are you setting people free? Where are you at in this process? Are you stuck in the mud? Are you standing just outside the mud pit saying how wonderful this is and going along with your life? Because as soon as free people stop setting other people free, they're no longer free. Because freedom is love. Freedom is restoring the fallen. Freedom is reaching back into the mud pit and bringing others out. Who are you doing that for? Who are you helping along? Because pastoring other people, helping other people, setting other people free, this isn't just the job of pastors. This is what we do as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And it's true freedom. And so before we, um, before we all just kind of like jump back into the mud pit, <laughs> trying to help people, which is wonderful, I want to give you a couple of cautions. And we're going to spend most of our time in verse 2, but these cautions appear in verse 1. So let's read verse 1, and we'll, we'll see there are two cautions in verse 1. He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. And, uh, and so here's the first caution. The first caution is this. You have to be free to set others free. You have to be free to set others free. We see that in the passage where he says, you who are spiritual. He doesn't say Everybody, therefore, go and rescue people out of the mud. If you're a drowning person or if you're sinking in quicksand, probably the first thing that you got to do, you got to take care of yourself. As soon as you start helping other people, you're going to start drowning. In fact, one of the rules in AA is that you've got to be sober, like, long term. Like, just because you've been sober for two months, they say you're not ready because you're going to fall off the wagon and do more harm than good. When Paul says, you who are spiritual, what is he talking about here? He uses this same word in other passages, 1 Corinthians 2 to 3, other passages to talk about those who are spiritually mature. He contrasts them with what he calls carnal Christians, Christians who are Christian in name but are living just like the world. And he says, unlike them, it's the job of the spiritual It's the job of those who are out of the mud pit. It's the job of those who are already walking in freedom who are called to set others free. So it's important for you and me to assess where we're at. Am I in the mud pit or am I on the side of the mud pit? We're all called to the same thing, ultimately to setting others free, but there's a process to get there. The spiritual. Those are the spiritually mature already walking in freedom. And just on that note, I feel like there's something else that that I've got to say. Because Wellspring as a church, we're a very open church. We're open about our weaknesses. We're open about our struggles. We're open about our sins. We don't hide it. We don't pretend. You hear me share my faults all the time. We say things like we're a judgment-free zone. And all of that is true. But I I think that sometimes with that, we we sometimes take it to, to this extreme where we start to say things like, well... You know, we're all just broken and struggling, and we are, none of us are really free. We hear people say things like, you know, every man uh, struggles deeply with lust, or, you know, everybody has 
anxious thoughts all the time and struggles with anxiety, or every woman has body image issues, and just this is just part of living. No, no, it's not, actually, because people do experience freedom from lust. People do experience freedom from anxiety and depression. People do experience freedom. Like, there, there are women who love their bodies, right? I mean, like, and they love their bodies not necessarily because they're a supermodel, but because Jesus loves the way he made them. And so, and so we don't, it, I just want you to know that, that, that there is such a thing as walking in actual freedom. I'm not saying that, like, you'll never have a lustful or anxious thought again. What I'm saying is you don't have to be saddled by these thoughts. You don't have to be characterized by that. The general disposition of your life is freedom and enjoying the freedom that Christ purchased for you. And that's what it means to be spiritual. Okay, so the first one is you have to be free to set others free. And the second one is this. The second caution is don't be harsh, be humble. Don't be harsh, be humble. And this comes in the part of the verse where he says that, uh, he says that it's, this is a task for the spiritual, but he also says that we're to restore people who've fallen with a spirit of gentleness. Some translations say of meekness. Humility, and these go together because humble people aren't harsh. The Galatians weren't very humble. They were filled with this sense of I'm righteous because I'm keeping all the law and I'm jumping through all the hoops, and holier-than-thou churches aren't very pleasant to be a part of. The Galatian church wouldn't have been very pleasant to be a part of because when you're proud and when you're full of yourself, you start to stare down at others and it makes you harsh and it ruins the whole restoration process. And it's inside of that, that exhortation to, to restore someone in gentleness that Paul says, keep watch on yourselves. That is, instead of staring down your nose at somebody else that you think you're holier than, look at your own self. Because in whatever area you judge your neighbor, you're likely to become just like your neighbor. And so if you judge your neighbor for being divorced, well, you might just find yourself signing papers. And if you judge your neighbor for being an alcoholic, you might find yourself in the throes of an addiction. And you can go on down the list. It's this sort of rule on the universe. And what you judge, it becomes of you. And so Paul says, don't be proud It's bad for you, you're going to fall into it. It's bad for them because it's so harsh, they'll never be restored. We need humility and we need gentleness. A humility that recognizes that we could fall into the exact same trap. So, it's it's January, as you know. Did you know that? It's January, got a few days left. And every January is a significant month for my dad, my old man. And the reason it's significant is that for all of his adult life, he was a teenager when he lost his dad to alcohol, and for all of his adult life, he has made the decision. He said, I can't let that same thing happen to me. And so every January, he abstains completely from alcohol, doesn't have a drop in January. And he's done that from all the years that I was a kid, before I was a kid, for all of his adult life. And what it is, it is, it is a humble recognition that he could fall into the same trap and that he's got to keep this thing under control. I tell you that because it's that decision and the decisions that we're making every day that impact the generations that come. I want to show you guys a picture that took place this summer. There's my dad, there's my mom, and there are our, the 11 grandkids. We're in Branson, Missouri. You see, that's a picture of legacy right there. Because what was passed on to my father, and don't get me wrong, Big John was a great man. And I could tell you stories that would bring tears to your eyes about his integrity and the goodness of this human being. But he was a good man who got trapped in an addiction that literally destroyed his life and wreaked havoc upon his family and didn't bring a good legacy. And how many families does it happen in where that legacy is passed on and then on and then on, a legacy that becomes destruction throughout the family? You guys have the power, 
and whatever those legacies are in your family line, to put a stop to that with you if you walk in humility and in friendship with God. And so my dad made that decision, and every one of those 11 grandkids knows the name of their pops. That's what they call them. I've called this series The Four Pillars of Freedom, and this message, God's Heart. And the reason is that freedom never stops with you. Freedom starts with you, and it multiplies through the generations It multiplies through your church family. It multiplies from every Bill Wilson to every Dr. Bob that's found in the phone book. It multiplies through your workplace and everywhere you go. God's heart is for freedom to multiply through you. God's heart is to set people free who set people free. Let's pray.